Hi, this is the Opinionated Science Educator, and welcome to part two of the recap lesson for the contact session that we had looking at classifying substances. In the last video, I highlighted how difficult it was to classify a substance, a pure substance, as either a compound or an element by just looking at them. In order to distinguish between a compound or an element at a macroscopic level, you would need to see if you could actually break it down into simpler substances. If it could not be broken down into simpler substances, then we would define it as an element. If it could be broken down into simpler substances, then we would define it as a compound. Remember I asked you if this white powder was a compound or element? Well, this experiment will show you that it is a compound. This experiment, the thermal decomposition of baking soda, has a number of advantages and I'd like to perform that today. You can also perform this experiment, and I'll show you that as well, inside a test tube, just a standard Pyrex type of test tube. And what I try to do is spread the baking soda across the bottom several centimeters across, like that. I'll turn on the Bunsen burners. And what we can already see here is the formation of water. That you see the water droplets appearing near the mouth of the test tube. The sodium bicarbonate was broken down into simpler substances such as water. Therefore, sodium bicarbonate is a compound. And remember these crystals that I showed you, especially the purple ones. Right, here I have a boiling tube. It contains a, a small crystal of iodine. There you are, you might be able to just see the iodine catching the light. So it's a crystalline, there it is. So I'm going to heat it gently. So here we are, just heat it up a little bit. And in fact, is that we're moving from the solid phase into the vapor phase very quickly. The solid iodine crystals changed from being solid to a gas when heated. So there was only a change in phase. It did not break down into simpler substances. Iodine is therefore an element. So now you have seen through these two videos the macroscopic definition of an element and a compound. So let's just revise what we know about the classification of substances. Matter can either be a pure substance or it can be a mixture. Mixtures can be separated by physical separation and mixtures are usually a mixture of pure substances such as elements and elements or elements and compounds and so on but they can be separated by physical means. First let's look at pure substances. Pure substances are further subdivided into elements that cannot be broken down into simpler substances such as iodine or compounds such as the sodium bicarbonate, which can be broken down into simpler substances. Mixtures can be defined either as homogeneous, such as salt water or mouthwash, or they can be heterogeneous, things like pizza, Italian salad dressing, and so on. So let's start looking at elements and bringing the definition and the explanation in terms of the particles together. So elements are the simplest form of matter, which means they cannot be broken down into smaller components physically or chemically. All the elements are there in the periodic table. Now there are some radioactive elements which break down, but it's not a chemical reaction, it's a nuclear reaction. Um, there are some examples of solid elements, aluminium, magnesium, zinc, silver, calcium, uh, gold, and so on. Those are all solid elements. There is one element that is a liquid that is a, as a metal, and that is mercury. Mercury is a liquid metal at room temperature. There is sulfur. Sulfur is a powder form. It's a solid element, but in the form of a powder. And 
chlorine is a gas element, a diatomic molecule of two chlorine atoms. It is a gas. So elements can be either solids, liquids, or gases. Now, in terms of the submicroscopic or particulate level, elements are made up of one type of atom only. So there I'm showing you the submicroscopic structure for the element copper and for silver. Please note that the atoms or the particles of silver are larger than the, cop than the particles of copper based on where they are in the periodic table. Now look at that uh, particular diagram. Is that an element? What do you think? And give reasons. Yes, that is an element. It is a molecule. So that could be oxygen gas, for example, made up of two oxygen atoms joined to form a molecule. But that is an element. Now, those different elements I showed you can be classified further either as metals or non-metals. So what is the difference between a metal and a non-metal? Firstly, all metals have luster or are shiny, whereas non-metals are often dull. Metals are malleable, in other words, we can hammer them into sheets, or they are ductile and can be drawn out into long wires. However, non-metals are brittle. Metals are often sonorous, so in other words, if you strike them, then they will give off a ringing sound, whereas non-metals are non-sonorous. And then metals are both thermal conductors, in other words, good conductors of heat, and electrical conductors. But non-metals are neither are thermal insulators and electrical insulators. So here are some more examples of metals. Lithium, sodium, potassium, all in group 1, copper, lead, and tin, which are transition metals. Here are some non-metals. Uh, sulfur, nitrogen, selenium, and there is bromine. Bromine is the second liquid element on the periodic table. So at a macroscopic level, you saw that a compound can be broken down into simpler substances. So let's look at the definition of a compound in terms of particles. A compound is made up of two or more different elements that are held together by chemical bonds and they function as a unit. A compound is a pure substance, just like an element, and it can but it can be broken down into simpler substances. So there I've given you some examples. Salt, sugar, carbon dioxide, methane, bromic acid, hydrochloric acid. When we name compounds, we often give a prefix depending on how many um, atoms are in the compound. So for example, NO is nitrogen monoxide, but NO2 is nitrogen dioxide. N2O4 is dinitrogen tetroxide, and so there are these rules for naming compounds based on the combination of the atoms that make them up. So now, at a submicroscopic level, compounds are made up of two or more different types of atoms. So there is one example. That is a compound represented by a green and red ball, therefore two different atoms making it up. There is ammonia, a representation of ammonia. There is water, one oxygen, two hydrogens in the solid, liquid, and gas phase. And there is a representation, first 3D representation, and then a cross-section of sodium chloride, which is an ionic substance or salt. So those are examples of compounds. Now here is water. Water is a compound. Remember, based on the demonstration, water can be broken down into simpler substances. So there is a water molecule. If I pass an electric current through water, it breaks up into two gases, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And there is always twice as much hydrogen as oxygen because the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is two to one in water. So water will break up into oxygen and hydrogen gas. And there we represent it symbolically saying a water molecule breaks up into hydrogen and oxygen. Let's end now by looking at mixtures. Remember, mixtures are either heterogeneous or homogeneous. There are some examples of heterogeneous mixtures like chocolate chip cookies, pizza, a tossed salad or a sandwich. And homogeneous mixtures are things like coffee, wine, air, brass, vinegar, steel, and blood. Okay, so mixtures are substances that are a combination of two or more materials. They are not chemically bonded together. 
Pure substances always consist of one type of matter throughout, but mixtures do not. They consist of two or more different types of matter combined together, and they can either be of elements or compounds. There are two types of mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Now, heterogeneous mixtures have visibly distinguishable components, whereas a homogeneous mixture appears uniform throughout. So solutions are examples of homogeneous mixture. Okay, so if we look at those pictures, those are mixtures. If we look at the first two pictures, uh, the one is of gases, the other is of methanol and water, um, and the other two diagrams on the other side show that the components are spread uniformly throughout, so those are homogeneous mixtures, whereas the two at the end, you can see clumps of the different components and that we would that is an example of a heterogeneous mixture so there is sulfur and iron mixed together you can see the components homogeneous it can be separated using the magnetism of the uh, iron there is salt water salt water can be evaporated using the Lyberg condenser the water can be cooled and you can collect the water and the salt will remain in the jar so until next time this is the Opinionated Science Educator signing off.